how we try to change that. <laughs> we feel for you. <laughs> kids good? Yeah, the kids All are right. good. Class. <laughs> Uh, I got a paper and pen so I can take notes on what you guys say. Okay. Can we take right. those Ali can Ali hear us? Ali, are you with us? Can you hear us? Can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? Hmm. Okay. okay, I'm gonna get started with the hope that at some point she is able to hear um, us. It's very in and out. I'm so sorry. No worries. We'll do the best we can to manage through, okay? So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Clark, and I'm the founding director of Catherine Clark Gallery and of Box Blur, both of which are in San Francisco. Today's topic is the arts, the curation of artistic expression, post-COVID museums, galleries, and stages in the modern repository of history. But all the actors have been financially harmed by the pandemic, and the solutions control its transmission. What is the future of our cultural depositories of the arts? Given the myriad ways COVID has reshaped our field, what are our thoughts on how the shifts in our culture will impact the future of the art world? We are joined in this discussion today by Michelle Delaney, president of 111 Minna Gallery. The gallery is a hybrid gallery, cafe, and events venue in San Francisco. We're also joined by Alex Nierges, the director and chief executive officer of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. Um, I'm really pleased to see that you are open. I noticed that from your website yesterday and um, compliments on the Annabelle Rosen exhibition. Mm -hmm. Said something, or you said something um, on your statement on the, the um, website that Rosen's artistic approach is grounded in resourcefulness, endurance, and a strong work ethic. If anything, I think it's the artist who will carry us, at least psychologically, through to the other side of the pandemic mm -hmm. by teaching us these very lessons and showing us that challenges often foster the most creative and inventive solutions. Alma Ruiz is a senior fellow at the Center for Business and Management of the Arts at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California and is a curator and writer. She's currently writing the history of MOCA from 1979 to 2000, which we got to talk about briefly last night. And she was also a curator there for some time. Ali Stabile is a visual artist in Brooklyn, New York, and her work uh, concerns itself, I believe, in some ways with the pandemic. We look forward to hearing from her as well. So it's my pleasure to meet all of you and to provide an opportunity for you to share how your experience of the pandemic has shaped your perspective on what lies ahead. And so what does lie ahead? According to the Brookings Institute, the fine and performing arts industries are some of the hardest hit by the pandemic. There are estimated losses of 1.4 million jobs and 42.5 billion in sales. The losses represent 50% of all jobs in the art industry and more than a quarter of all lost sales nationwide. These numbers are astounding, and like the losses of lives in this pandemic, nearly impossible to comprehend. Who knew that the arts were responsible for a quarter of all sales in the United States? I found that figure striking. In spite of these devastating numbers, however, I believe the pandemic has made a positive impact on the arts industry in many ways, and that we will emerge better for it. As artists often remind me, creative response is the answer. The artist Nina Kachadorian, uh, whose practice reflects how creative expression is born of constraint, taps into this idea in her recent exhibition, to feel something not of this world, in which she represents the 38 days in 1972 that the Robertson family spent stranded at sea in a dinghy after their boat capsized. During the pandemic, Nina engaged, in the oldest, engaged with the oldest living member of that family in a 38-day conversation, both about his experience nearly 50 years ago on the open sea with no food and water in a tiny vessel, and its parallels in this COVID moment. That show was reviewed by Joy Finkel for the New York Times. Quote, the Robertson story bears some resemblance to how we've all been living this year, isolated from each other in our own little shipwrecks. <clears throat> the story is also about the incredible invention, resourcefulness, and creativity the Robertsons bring to their predicament. Quote, they have an optimism I find striking. They just keep at it, says Nina. The Robertson survival, their ordeal through, survived their ordeal through ingenuity, a positive outlook, and some luck. Perhaps we have had similar experiences through this moment when we have had to look at resources available to us and make different decisions than we have in the past, even then through past recessions. I'm struck by how uh, working together uh, has been able to effectively uh, help us to problem solve and survive. 
it's quite the metaphor for us. In San Francisco, galleries are designated retail and are therefore allowed to be open. We took advantage of our designation to program exhibits that are open to the public without appointment and to host performances. This meant, for example, that we were able to schedule Rufus Wainwright to perform in person, his only live concert in the US since the pandemic. I'm interested in hearing how you and your institutions have survived through creative responses. <clears throat> I'm pleased that galleries and museums have increasingly provided more online content from lectures and panel discussions to walkthroughs and online catalogs, from 3D exhibits of shows to other types of free content. All of this has meant more access to the arts, more education, which in my estimation is a good thing for the future in terms of expanded audience. Many social media challenges, like those dressing up to resemble your favorite artwork, have made artists and art appreciators of more of us. Perhaps after all uh, this is over, more people will find that their need for creative expression and engagement, heightened by the isolation of the pandemic, is forever changed for the good of the art world. Perhaps there will be more appreciation and respect for those who make their living in creative fields. Tech has also attracted younger audiences to art more than ever before and inspired creative responses, like that of the young curator Ilde Forgione at the Uffizi and her TikTok animators of artworks and their pairings with contemporary music, like Botticelli's Venus dancing to Todrick Hall's nails, hair, hips, heels. As a result, attendance at the Uffizi rose among young people. The last time I checked, the Uffizi's TikTok post had received more than 60,000 views alone. Online platforms like Artsy have helped people who were fearful of walking into galleries to learn more about and purchase artworks from the comfort of their bedroom. Now armed and more, with more knowledge and confident, confidence in their taste, perhaps these new collectors will wander into brick and mortar spaces after the pandemic. I imagine the screen overload might bode well for a post-pandemic return to museums and galleries. Personally, I found that the pandemic has meant that there's greater transparency and collaborative attitudes in the art world. It's easier to access pricing. Gallerists and nonprofit administrators are talking more openly to one another and sharing survival strategies and even partnering to present projects. We're doing just that with several nonprofits in our region so that we can present a large public project titled Night Watch by Shimon Addy about LGBTQI refugees to the San Francisco Bay Area audience this fall. Had it been a normal year of art fairs and travel, I would not have had the time or focus to build these coalitions. Dayoung Lee writes in Art Review that the role of art must be to connect people beyond time and borders and to remind people of how creativity enables a comprehensive understanding of different histories and culture. Thus, art must con constantly consider its social and public role. It must read the values of the period and weigh the role and practices of art in the midst of these values. Art that offers a tolerant worldview and that is capable of seeing the value of diversity and marginalized voices is the kind of art we look forward to in the future. That future is now, and I couldn't agree more. People are apparently turning to culture in record numbers as a salve for loneliness, even if this pivot is still mostly online. As Cecile Gerardot, the curator of the De Chirico exhibition at the Musée d'Orsay, said about her exhibit opening and closing through the pandemic, there's an obligation to show artwork. Culture is important in time of crises. In closing, I just wanted to share a passage of Jason, Jason Farrago of the New York Times, who wrote a year ago, perhaps it's best now to reflect on what our present isolation teaches us about what art has become and what we want, to look at, want it to look like when we reemerge. So now I'm turning it over to you and want to ask you to briefly talk about your forecast for what lies ahead in a post-COVID art world. What will emerge? Alma, we're going to start with you, since you are looking at these questions through the lens of academia and a curatorial practice. Thank Alma. you so much, um, Catherine. Yes, uh, you know, the uh, I have been um, teaching curatorial practices and exhibition making at the Center for Business and Management of the Arts at Claremont Graduate University. It is a graduate program, uh, three semesters, and we have a certain number of international students we have students from Asia, we have students from Europe, and of course the US. And during a year ago, I remember that we finished our mo first module of the year on March 3rd. That was the end of it. And in a week, the university had to pivot to start teaching online. So it was quite destabilizing and it was confusing. And of course, uh, the foreign students were dealing with personal matters as well. Uh, and, and even some of our uh, students here are come from other states. So they were also dealing about what to do. Should they go back to their home? Should they stay in California? So all of that had to be in a way uh, resolved. 
you know, and while the students were beginning, you know, their second module, which was a week or so later. So there was a lot going back and forth. Uh, the museum pivoted to online teaching. We had to close our downtown center, which is where I usually teach. I don't go to the Claremont University, um, Claremont Graduate University campus at all. It's quite, um, it's about 20, at least 20 miles from my home and traffic is terrible. So all of us who can't teach downtown do that because it's a lot easier in terms of accessibility. And it's an advantage for our students to come downtown and from downtown then we can branch out and go to other museums uh, on the west side of the city. So uh, once, you know, the professors were not prepared in a way for online teaching. So the university had to start training us on the use of Zoom, you know, because that wasn't something we were doing. <laughs> so um, it, we, we were barraged by emails from the provost. It was hard to keep up. And we started training, you know, and we sort of, in a way, we trained as we could. I guess some faculty had more time to train more thoroughly. Some of us were kind of a patchwork, catching a session here, a session there, because we needed to pivot right away to online teaching. But we did it, you know, and in some cases, it's been positive, I would say. You get the students' attention. I like that. Students are looking at me. Um, I think instead of sort of letting their minds wander, they seem to be more focused. Our classes are small. Usually, when I teach tutorial courses, the first module, I can get up to 20, 22 students. But after that, the number goes down to half. So my classes are usually about 10 students, which is really great because I can focus more on individual teaching. And in this case, the university really wanted us to be very sensitive to our students. Uh, understand their situation. You know, some of them did go back to their countries. I had one student in China, one student in Russia for a while, and the other Chinese students stayed here because it was too difficult to go back home. So in the end, they decided to stay in LA. And then, of course, our uh, US students were um, in a slightly better position. But the university really recommended that we be more tolerant, that we allow the students for some adjustment, Students who didn't want to be seen on screen, you know, could then turn off the uh, video and so on. So the museum was very, the uh, university was very, very um, good about that, very understanding. Uh, we recorded, of course, the, the sessions in case someone missed the session, then they could watch the recording and follow so they wouldn't miss any of the classes. And now the university, after a year of that, the university is planning to open in September. So we continue to teach online. Spring and summer will start opening in September and the university has given the faculty the option of two modes of teaching. So we have, if you want to teach in person, so, or, you, or you have so the in-person instruction and you have a hybrid instruction. So because of what I teach, I've selected the hybrid. Um, Side. So I will be teaching two hours in person. One hour is going to be uh, via uh, Zoom, and that will be great. In terms of the program, we also, you know, we lost students. Certainly some students do not feel they want to be taught online, and I think this is something that all universities have had to deal with. So many of our, some of our students decided to uh, pause, you know, their degree and come back when the um, in-person instruction begins again. Uh, some students were considering maybe, especially for students, uh, considering coming to Los Angeles because Los Angeles is a draw in terms of the city, what the city offers. If they were going to be home, not being able to take advantage of being in Los Angeles, so they decided to postpone, um, perhaps considering the university, you know, as their next uh, step. So, but now we see numbers going back up. You know, we're beginning to see, it, which is fantastic. It's very encouraging to see that. And I think that with a hybrid, at, at least in my, uh, many students have found a certain advantage to teaching online. But what is really surprising is that the university uh, surveyed faculty 
uh, about these two options. And apparently 54% of faculty would like to teach online, which is kind of an interesting result, you know. Um, my course, we can't because part of my course is to take the, uh, the students to museums and to other arts organizations and to meet you know, with curators, to meet with administrators, to meet with registrars, and, and, and also when they stay in my course, we do studio visits as well. So, you know, studio visits can be done online, that's possible, but I always feel that it's better to meet the artists in person. So that's with respect to, um, with, to academia where we're at. So actually we're seeing positive signs in that respect. Now, with respect to museums, you know, yeah, last museums, uh, the arts have been hit really, really hard in Los Angeles museums, um, especially part timers, uh, frontline front line workers, um, also uh, education, maintenance and security were the areas in museums that were hit the hardest. Uh, now many um, museums have been calling back their furlough um, staff and they are getting ready to open. We have to understand that in Los Angeles, um, museums have been closed, completely closed for an entire year. So they closed in mid-March of 2020 and the governor has just given museums the green line to reopen. So it's a, it's a full year. So by the time the museums open, it's going to be a little bit more than that. They are getting ready to reopen uh, with 25% capacity with safety protocols in place. And of course, you know, they're all, um, they're all incurring expenses. Reopening expenses are higher for museums than for smaller venues. LACMA has announced uh, Los Angeles County Museum that it will open on April 1st. The Hammer Museum will do it by mid-April. MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Northern Samuel Museum have not announced the reopening dates yet. There's nothing on their websites. And the Huntington Library and Gardens has actually been the only museum here that's been able to keep their gardens open. You know, they closed their, their exhibition uh, build areas, but the gardens have been open throughout the pandemic, except for very short periods of time in which they had to, con to close. But they have uh, used the, the gardens to um, really a lot of families in the area, a lot of young people, they go there to relax. Uh, there is a steep fee, admission fee is $25, but you can stay the entire day. And it's quite lovely and it's a lot, it's crowded. I mean, it's, it's amazing how many people have taken advantage of the, of the Huntington Gardens uh, and, and spend their day there, especially families with small children who want a place for kids to run around a little bit, you know, and, and, and uh, it's, it's been very good for them. I think that I talked to some of my colleagues about, you know, what, what happened to their exhibition program, of course, you know, was that altered in any way? And they uh, mentioned that, I said, are there any exhibitions that have become irrelevant because they were not you know, presented when they were supposed to. And actually, that hasn't happened as much as I thought. Uh, Mocha lost the Richter exhibition that was coming from the Met because that was supposed to arrive in Los Angeles in late summer of 2020. And of course, you can't hold on to loans uh, for too long. So the Richter show never happened in Los Angeles, which is a great loss. And of course, another exhibition that we all have been waiting for is made in LA the Hammer Museum's Biennial, which this uh, last year was supposed to happen in June, and it was going to be at the Hammer Museum and at the Huntington Library. So there was this collaboration between these two venues for the Made in LA Biennial, but that then was uh, shifted to September. Of course, it didn't open in September, but it's going to be opening now in mid-April, and they have retitled it. I think they, they now call it Made in LA 2020, a version. And so we're all looking forward to it. You can make appointments uh, now to, to see the exhibition. And of course, going to the Huntington is gonna be a, a, not a problem. Um, Orange County museums have fared better with shorter closings. Their COVID uh, infection rates and deaths have been much lower than the LA County. So they have been able to open, but they recently closed and now they will be reopening again. Um, however, you know, in, in all of this, there is a glimmer of hope. I think institutions have not, they were hit hard, but somehow they've been able to, to hold on. And smaller 
arts organizations, which we were expecting that many of them would flounder, have in Los Angeles have actually been able to um, to stay on and to survive. Um, a lot of, uh, about 27 small organizations in Los Angeles actually immediately grouped together under Los Angeles Virtual Arts Alliance. They created this group um, to be able to network, to be able to talk to each other, to, to be able to, um, to see how they could stay relevant and stay afloat. And I think they started to meet weekly. And it's been very great, uh, a very uh, great um, step for them because they got to know their neighbors. They got to know other organizations in town. Uh, organizations that were less known are now sort of, you know, part of this, um, that ha are, have gained in visibility, I think. And it's been a tremendous gain for the smaller organizations. Um, the California State University Art Galleries, you know, California State University is the university that runs up and down through the whole state of California. And they also form a consortium. And now, you know, they are in conversation uh, to see uh, how they can continue to collaborate or they have to they can continue to uh, be in, in touch, you know, and work together. We also have, um, and of course, you know, one of the things that really helped uh, Los Angeles institutions and, and artists were grants. Uh, we had the Warhol grant, which actually uh, sent the money to and one organization in Los Angeles to distribute to artists. So Lays, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions received the Warhol grant and they were able to give about 76% of the grant uh, to artists in the form of $1,500 grants. The, um, the Mike Kelly Foundation stepped up. They gave project grants and also grants to help with overhead. So the Mike Kelly Foundation was right there, you know, with Mike's spirit, really uh, helping artists uh, a lot. And of course, you know, we are now, we're very lucky to have the Getty Foundation, which has really stepped up in recent years. And, um, and Alma, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, it's so interesting what you're saying. I, I think we're running a little short on time. So, okay. maybe, so this is yeah. the other thing, actually. So I, we can talk about this, but I think we can talk about the Getty Foundation grants. You know, because they have really kept some of these institutions afloat with emergency and recovery grants, but also with PST 2024, you know, Pacific Standard Time. So we can talk about that during the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I think Alex will have something to share, too, about grants that they've had in uh, through the museum and through Virginia. So um, but let's turn to Michelle now. And uh, Michelle, tell us a little bit about your experience. Hi, that was great. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so Hi, much. Hi, neighbor. <laughs> so, so my name is Michelle Delaney. I am one of the owners of 111 Minute Gallery. We are an art gallery that's been in downtown San Francisco for 27 years. We have been doing um, art shows, new art shows every month, uh, mostly for the majority of those years. Um, and so it's been a really neat experience coming in every day having new art on the walls and because we are open as a bar and a dance club and a coffee shop and a community center, we constantly have people flowing through. So my experience with art and the public is just really being present, really being there, being able to show people the art and they, them enjoy it. And so it was a, it was funny, but not funny. You know, the, the, it was a April, April, March 6th, March 6th, we had a, um, solo show with Nick Flat, and it was called Cancelled. He does these portraits. <laughs> <laughs> and literally that same, you guys know, like that same next week, all of a sudden, everyone in downtown San Francisco left. They left their jobs. They left their offices. They all went home, right? And we're just stuck there like, okay, we just had a terrific art opening. It was a super fun Friday. I had like the best time ever. I was hugging people, having love, love, love. And then, and Nick is an artist that's down in LA, by the way. Um, and then all of a sudden, the next week, I have to literally let my staff go. You know, I have, I have you know, 30 staff members. And I was like, hey, there's nobody here to serve. So me and the two other owners just kind of went and bartended and just did coffee a little bit and kept the place open, a couple managers. And we're like, whoa, I mean, it just like flatlined down there, right? It was weird. It was tumbleweeds and no, no time flat. And Previously, because I'd been down there for 20 years, I was like, wow, this area is starting to feel like New York City. You know, there's all these like tech companies. People are, you know, it's very hustle and bustle. It's super neat. There's new food places to eat. So the area had become just this really 
fun, fun arts and cultural area that a lot of people were coming into. And, you know, a lot of kids going to the Academy of Art College. That was awesome. So to see it turn into just nothing was very strange. So that happened in April. And then, you know, kind of, I think we all were in shock for that entire month of April. Like, okay, what's happening? When are we coming back? We're going to all start working again. And we were just kind of fighting to get that PPP. And then as soon as that kind of got resolved that we could uh, go ahead and apply for a PPP because there's no income coming in, we're like, okay, what are we going to do? Mm-hmm. So we decided, I called Ron Turner up. He had a Last Gas 50th anniversary show that was planned. There was, you know, it was all these shows planned. And I was like, hey, Ronnie, do you want to do a live stream? You know, like who wants to do a live stream? Like, why do you want to do that? So we decided, okay, let's go ahead and do that. And instead of just doing one show live stream, we had to get totally crazy and do Ron Turner's 50th anniversary live stream at the same time as the return, an art show we did for just local artists. Then we did a Black Lives Matter art show and we did a gender fluid art show. And we also did kind of a Sunny and Cher, um, Donnie and Marie Osmond, like variety television show. We did a three day, like, let's do what Minna does and support all the artists as we do and get singers and comedians and dancers and yoga and fine arts and put it all together because we couldn't possibly just do one thing because that would just be <laughs> too easy. So, so it was really, fun. it was really fun and it went really well. And I remember at one point when I was sitting there looking at the screen and I think it was a Doug Rhodes piece. He has kind of pieces that are a little more, um, they're not flat or a little more three dimensional that the camera was going through and looking at his piece and it looked totally different than the way I had been staring at his piece on the wall. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. This medium, this is a camera that to us is an art medium, you know, a hundred something years. I went to film school, I learned about the camera, you know, and I, I didn't look at it, look at it as like this art medium to film our other art medium and the things we could get out of that. So for me, I was like, wow. This is eye opening. This is amazing. I can, my eyeballs can see something and I can enjoy it. And then I can see it through a different lens, literally, and a different perspective. And it was also really nice to sit there with a glass of wine and have somebody talk me through the piece of art. A lot of the times when I'm walking through my gallery, unless I grab the curator, you know, I'm not hearing, or the artist, I'm not hearing about the piece of art and having it talked through to me. So that was really, really neat too. So, so then, you know, I kind of had to reflect a little bit. I was like, all right, you know, I went to film school. I'm a hip lady. Why have I been so repelled by social media? Right. I just have been like present at the gallery. I want to show you the real piece. I don't want to be on Facebook. I don't want to be on Twitter. I don't want to be wasting my time on Instagram. Like that's a waste of my time. I don't want to be on YouTube. And that was how I felt before. Now that I've started having the time to get into it, you know, I've started our YouTube channel. I've started, we've started working on the Instagram and the Facebook and the sky has even built us a virtual reality model of 111 minute gallery that our last show we just had Discolandia, which was 150 artists painting on vinyl. It is up in the virtual reality world. So now that that show is coming down this week, it's going to stay up there. And people can go in there and you can get close and you can actually mm-hmm. see the paintings. It's amazing. And then um, even this morning I went and listened to, um, you know, some talks on that, you know, the NFT that's coming out in this whole other world of what's going on in the VR space. And those are the non-fungible tokens, which is a whole nother crazy world. But I've been having a lot of fun with this and I've been really getting into it and doing the live streams and being able to do the live streams from 11 minute gallery and showing the art. Now, yes, it has been very sad to have 230 pieces up on my walls from 150 artists that we live streamed. And then after I try to book appointments every once in a while and I try to keep people from, you know, I don't want to catch COVID. They don't want to catch COVID. Let's, you know, get you all in for an, two people for an hour or half an hour at a time, you know, and it's been sad. I mean, I've told every artist when they've come back to pick up their pieces, I was like, okay, we're redoing the show next December, January, when we can all get together. Because yes, it is really fun to find all these online platforms and figure them out and do them. But it is also just 
totally depressing and sad not to have people in there physically seeing the pieces. It's like I'll walk in there and it'll just be like, oh, this is so amazing. I need people to see this and to feel it and to be around it and feel its presence. So, Michelle, I think that's a good transition to um, uh, pass the baton here to Alex. Um, because they've had a really uh, similar experience of having to have less audience, but um, but they're open, which is fantastic. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Catherine. And, you know, I, I, my heart goes out to you at the gallery because uh, the experiences we've all had, you know, the question I'd start with is who knew uh, March 13th when we faced the notion that we have to close. And yeah. to just give you a quick background of, of our museum, um, we're the only art museum in America that's open with free general admission 365 days a year. So wow. imagine facing the notion of closing. We, we don't close for anything. We're open yes. seven days a week, three nights a week, uh, and we have the best hours of any art museum in the country. So closing was just against the grain of how we exist. Uh, and all of the things that, that cascade from that, uh, you know, clearly are, are very different. Uh, our institution, we, we're one of the 10 largest comprehensive art museums in America. Encyclopedia collection, we have probably about 5,000 works of art on display. And so to have, like, your gallery space, this cavernous building, we have three quarters of a million square feet with no employees except for guards, our housekeeping people, uh, and, and, a, and a few of us uh, that were coming and going, is to, it's, it was eerie. Okay. Yeah. Closed for three and a half months. Uh, fast forward, uh, we reopened poetically on the 4th of July to the public and uh, have been open ever since. Now, like most museums that have reopened, uh, we're only seeing about 30% of our uh, normal audience. Yeah. In fact, we had this massive exhibition uh, from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo um, that began, what well, was supposed to begin in May, did not begin until July 4th. And we expected about a third of a million visitors for that exhibition. Uh, we budgeted on the, on the case of 225,000. Nine thousand people come and see that exhibition. So if you then start thinking about the other good parts of, of the pandemic, and obviously there are very few when you see 530,000 people dying in, from, a, from a virus, but what's happened is, is, is intriguing because we have been having online programs for years. No one ever came. We have a few people and people just roundly ignored them. Now we programs. Uh, and we'll have, for example, we had a, a, one of our, our, our curator of ancient uh, Egyptian art gave a lecture, and we had more than a thousand people. That could never happen with the museum. That's great. Yeah. We, have, we, have a, we have a theater with 500 seats, so we would have had to live stream it into another space, but that would never happen. Um, yeah. What we've also found, and, and we've been very religious about the protocols, uh, about cleaning and all of things. Plus, we have uh, an HVAC system, our, our heating and cooling system, that's virtually state of the art. And it is good as anything other than a surgical suite in the hospital. Yeah. And so we built up this confidence with the public who look at us and say, okay, you're, you're limiting the number of people. We can only have 250 people in the gallery spaces, which, you know, our public spaces are a quarter million square feet. You can wander around and not see people other than guards for in, in forever, even if we have a full complement of 250 visitors at the same time, which we do. And we have to then have people queue up outside uh, six feet apart uh, until they can come in. Um, but the losses, you know, you talk about, I'm sure your, your, your pain, I feel it, because uh, yeah. our, our ticket sales obviously diminished to next to nothing. Our food and beverage, we have a restaurant, we have a cafe, where we make our bread and butter, so to speak, on, on food and beverages with special yeah. events. We yeah. do something on the order of 300 outside events a year, uh, mm -hmm. weddings, corporate events, dinners, soirees. Wow. And 
Mm-hmm. We're down to zero. Uh, income went mm-hmm. from something on the on the gross side of about ten million dollars a year to zero. Uh, and as a result, you know, we have had to tighten our belt. But here's the good side: uh, the markets are up, so our endowments providing us great support. Right. Yes. Museum, they yes. continue to support us, and then mm-hmm. contributions are up. Our contributions were up by several million dollars over the previous year because people are being generous to give to institutions. And obviously, we're not providing uh, food and shelter for people. We're providing solace for the soul. But they're, they're, support, they're supporting that. Um, you know, also on the good side, we've been able to keep our employees uh, uh, in community. We did have a furlough that only happened to part-time people in the food and beverage areas and visitor services mm-hmm. because we had a couple of dozen come to our HR offices and say, we want to be laid off because we're missing the $600 a week and we can't yeah. collect it. Yeah. So we, we ended up doing that for a select number of people, uh, brought everybody back, obviously, in mid-June, so it was less than 60 right. days. So and everybody continued to stay on. Uh, with mm-hmm. benefits and everything else. Uh, and we have been able to then provide bonuses to all of the people that are on the front line to help augment uh, their pay uh, because they may have a spouse, a significant other, or someone else in the family that's been laid off, uh, and and times are, are difficult. Um, building the trust, you know, we're back to normal. The online boom is, is, is fabulous. Uh, and I'm going to just stick my neck out and make a prediction. Here we are in March. Uh, obviously, they're vaccinating 3 million people a day. And I'm happy to say, knock on wood, uh, at 3 o'clock today, I'm getting my first vaccination. Uh, we will all be there. We will all be there if, if we're smart enough to say yes, which we all should be. We'll all be there, as the president's told us, by May. And I'm predicting, though, by the time we get to the fall of 2021, this fall, six months from now, we will be back to something much closer to normal uh, than ever before. But I'll say this. We'll be better than what we thought of as normal because of the online presence, because people realizing that the connection they have as individuals, and whether it's going to... Uh, Mina Gallery or going to Catherine's Gallery, uh, coming to our art museum. Obviously, my colleagues in Los Angeles who've been closed for a year, uh, Michael Govan and I were on a, a Zoom call Wednesday, and we were all celebrating for him because April 1st is, is their liberation day. Mm-hmm. But I'm That's predicting good. people will have realized how valuable it is to have that personal, mm-hmm. upfront experience with the real object. And to be able to see artwork, to listen to curators talk in person, uh, I think it's going to be better than ever before. I agree. And I wonder, um, you know, we've. it sounds like everybody has talked about the value of the online, right? All the mm-hmm. content that has been created, that people are paying attention to. You know, you were saying that you had an audience that was twice the size of what could be in the theater. with our audience again too. Do you think that there will be the same demand for um, or continued demand for online content? Because I feel like there will be, but I'm curious to hear your perspectives. Yeah, I can say in Los Angeles, I think that because of the way the city, you know, the way the city is spread out, you know, and the fact that traffic at certain times of the day makes you lose a lot of time. I think we have, many of us agree that in terms of perhaps meetings or or certain programming that we are so willing to do that online because we can do it from the comfort of our office or our home. And, you know, instead of wasting an hour to get to some place, we can have the meeting right then. So for us, for certain activities, it'll be uh, it'll be great to have a lot of programming online because it's a time saver, you know, and it's more comfortable. You don't want to rush into traffic. You don't want to be late. You don't want to get into an accident. 
which can happen. You know, you don't want to be frustrated and tired by the time you get to your destination. So I think that in some sense, yes, we, we, we got used to being online. We discovered that we like to perspective certain things. And even and, and for programming, maybe for lectures, for panel discussions, meetings, I think that that has been a plus, you know. And, it, and I think it's going to continue. So museums are not, they had to spend a lot of the resources, you know, pivoting online. But I think they will continue to use that also as a very strong form of, of, of um, outreach, you know, for everyone. Yeah. What do you think, Michelle, given that you had some hesitations on social media and so forth, and now it sounds like you've really embraced it? Yes, I am definitely think for me that being able to reach out globally is very exciting prospect. Um, one of the things we did in the VR space that this guy built is he showed me we went and met some guy on the top of some building in New Jersey and brought him back to the middle of a minute virtually and like told him about our space and told him about San Francisco. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so okay. This is not as weird as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> you know, I remember the Michael Douglas movie where there was a virtual mm -hmm. guy. I was like, ah! Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really looking forward to it and very excited about the prospect and being and learning about it and doing it. I think it's going to be really fun. So I'm going to be doing it probably a nice even of both, right? Mm -hmm. um, and hybrid, I, like we've been yeah, talking about. Hybrid, yeah. you know, like, let's pay attention to both of them. And, and Alex, I'm wondering, you know, given that you had twice the capacity of what you were able, what you'd be able to handle in the theater, have you thought about, I don't know if doing lectures was a revenue stream for the museum, but if you can double that revenue through online programming, is that a consideration or is it important to keep this stuff free? Well, we, you know, we've, we've been in lots of conversations in the art museum world about monetizing the online presence. And we're firm believers in being free. We charge only for a few things, a few very premium programs and lectures. And then, of course, things like uh, a big, big special exhibition, a big traveling exhibition. Most of our exhibitions, and we do dozens of them a year, are all free. And some of them are quite long. Um, what we, we see is the, the ability, though, is just expanding audience, reaching more people. 50% uh, mm -hmm. of the people that attended our online programs in the last year were new visitors to the museum. And so what we want to do is translate that online visitor into somebody who's going to come and physically visit the museum. Now, one could say, okay, we can maybe monetize that down the road. They like what they see. They become members. Uh, they eat in our restaurant. They buy things in our oh, shop. Yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly. So th those kinds of, of things will happen, and we think they'll happen in a fairly significant way over time. Um, but, you know, free is a beautiful word, and we love just pushing it out that way. Yeah. Uh, I think if this moment has taught us anything, free is really important and free is not even really free to a lot of communities right um right. and so i think maybe the kinds of changes that we need to advocate for in our industry are how, not only how do we make things free galleries have always been free some museums but we know that's still um not the only barrier to entry so mm -hmm. i do think the online thing has expanded audience but i still think there's more work to do mm -hmm. we are uh at three minutes before they're gonna shut us down here. Um, I'd ask you each to make a brief closing statement if you want to. I'll start. I think that, um, but you know, it's, it's really comforting uh, for me as a person who has spent her entire life in the museum, and who loves the art and has a passion for that that I try to really transmit to my students. You know, we organized an exhibition at the end of the course. It's usually it's a physical space, a gallery space where we do our exhibition, a student exhibition. Last year we had to pivot to an online exhibition and we did a video exhibition for that. And so I think that uh, in Los Angeles, I'm very comforted, comforted that museum, even though they were hard hit and were closed for an entire year, that some institutions actually came up to support, like the Getty Foundation has been a great resource. Uh, PSD 2024 uh, has 45 arts organizations, uh, cultural institutions uh, uh, participating. 
And in 2020, they were given research grants for about $5 million, which was a good contribution for many organizations. You know, a small organization gets $110,000 for research money, and that goes a long way. And in 2022, they will be getting their second grant, which will be for exhibition and programming. And again, there will be substantial grants from the Getty. So I think that's really helped our organizations and it's put it put them on a firm shooting uh, a footing to start again uh, opening to the to the public, you know, in a few weeks. So very positive okay. about the arts in Los Angeles at this point. Okay, we got less than two minutes here. Okay, um, I just want to say again for us all to again with the art and how it is such a great part of our existence in life, how art has pulled all of us through COVID. You know, it's been there for us and with these new ways to see it online, it's really inspired us and kept us going. So I just appreciate all of you, appreciate the art, appreciate the artists, and I'm so thankful that we have that in our lives. <laughs> all right, Alex, you have the final word here. Well, first of all, thank you, Catherine, for organizing this and for bringing us all together and, and helping yes. make this happen. Uh, yes. But I'm going to just give a plug for artists because this starts with artists and I'll give a plug for you as, as gallerists, uh, buy art. We're in the business of, of buying art a lot. Uh, and we love doing it. And we also support artists with, with grants. In fact, we give more money to artists, uh, albeit all they're all, they have to be Virginia artists than any other art museum in the country. And so my, my, uh, Plea for everybody is buy art, enjoy it, and help support the economy, but help support artists. Wonderful. Oh my great. Yeah, it, it's so nice meeting all of you, and I couldn't agree more with uh, the buy art, see art, support artists uh, uh, ending to this. And um, say hi to my friend Valerie uh, Cassell. Oh, I will. I will. Yeah. I'll tell you.